somewhere, it's probably closed source. Pick all the prompts out of the way. Um, so in the early days, OPAM often had to be built from sources. Now it's present on most OS package managers out of the box. So I'm going to do the demonstration that's mostly on Ubuntu, which hasn't yet updated to OPAM 2.0, but fortunately, our very own AVSM uh, maintains a PPA, so we're able to switch to that. So I'm just now going to share my screen. Hopefully. Yes, right. So um, this is an Ubuntu focal installation. So it's 24, it's the, the um, current LTS. And as I said, OPAM is available from its package manager straight away. Um, doesn't take terribly long to pull up and install. It's probably familiar from CI systems, if not from your own systems. And once that's through, the only slight problem that we get is that that is 205. So very quickly, we'll do a live upgrade to OPAM 2.1. And we pull in this one, hot off the presses. And hopefully this time, Oops, switched keyboards and apparently I can't type on it. There we go, so we're now at OPAM 2.1. So um, I don't know how easy it is to do a show of hands. I imagine most people here have probably used OPAM for anyone who hasn't. OPAM requires you to begin by initializing it, so it won't do anything until it's been started up. And we do that by issuing this OPAM in its command. At this point, it's contacting a web server that downloads a tarball copy of the latest OPAM repository. So it's pulling down the package definitions, that's quite fast. It's then processing them, bringing them in to create what we call an OPAM root. So which is a collection of your OCaml installations and the information that's known about the metadata. Once that's complete, I have actually already initialized this container. So OPAM, as well as maintaining installations, attempts to be a shell wrapper and a, a, a management tool for being able to use commands and things distributed through it. So it, it has a lot of shell integration that, as it happens, is already set up. So I shouldn't say no. And then the exciting part, which the eagle eye will spot is new in 2.1. Um, OPAM then goes on to create an initial switch because the primary aim of OPAM in it is to get you to be able to run on camel. And at this point, it puts this new thing called a switch invariant together and constructs a switch. It detects that I have OCaml 481 as a result of the Ubuntu package that has it there, and it's now set us up. So it tells us to run this little rune in order to update the environment. And we can then see that it's added something to my path as well as doing a few other bits and bobs that now means that I should be able to um, access binary files that I install and it's installed a small handful of packages. So that's the, the very first opening into OPAM. Um, its main purpose right since 1.0 is to be able to create um, lots of uh, different switches. So at this point, I can then create a, a new switch for my project if I wish. With a little room that goes together there. And it creates a second switch for me. Um, as it happens, even in here, there's another feature that's new in OPAM 2.1. That command itself wouldn't work in OPAM 2.0, but we'll come back to that in a bit. So here I've asked OPAM to create a brand new switch. I've given this a name and I've said, would you please put OCaml 481 into it? And as a result of the fact that the system has got OCaml 481 installed by the OS package manager, it's quite a fast process of doing it. I run the rune again, and we can then see that it's updated path to point to the new path. So far, so good. And we now have two switches in our OPAM root installation. Um, now, building our camel compilers takes quite a long time. So I prepared a few earlier. If you will just forgive me resetting my root. So now I have the same setup as I had before, but I've also built our camel 4, 2, 5, 11, 12, and 13. Um, on top of that, our camel uh, OPAM isn't just for managing your um, switch installations. It's also about discovering packages, being able to um, mine information about packages, and so on and so forth. So 
Um, our camel comes with a rudimentary top level. There is a slightly better one. So we have the ability to search for a package and we can see here's UTOP. Why don't we install that? At which point OPAM starts carrying out its main job. We can ignore that for the time being. It's just a, an artifact of the installation. So at this point, OPAM is now working out exactly what needs to be installed in order to get this package UTOP that we requested. And it's now come back with what it thinks we're going to do. It says, I can give you UTOP 280 and I'm going to do all of this stuff above as a result of doing that in order to satisfy it. So we let that run through. It's relatively fast. Another OPAM 2.1 thing that we've worked on, which is subtle, but it's actually downloading and building things at the same time, which if you're downloading 300 packages is kind of useful because it does mean that it starts building Dune within a few seconds of um, beginning. And it does prioritize the downloads based on what's earlier in the dependency chain as well. So in fact, here uh, you can see there were packages being installed before it had even retrieved everything that needed to be done, even when it was using the cache. So at that point, it's finished the installation and we have UTOP. So far, so good. Then we can go back to a previous switch. We don't need to follow the runes because I've allowed OPAM shell integration to automatically update the path. And I try to run UTOP again. And it says no, because we've, we've left that switch. It's completely isolated from the rest of the shell environment. And that's the end of that. Um, OPAM gives a nice little hatch. You can actually choose to run commands from other switches if you want. So I can run my project and then pull up UTOP from within that switch and bring it back. Then on top of that, if we now look at, for example, OPAM show UTOP 280, we can see in the description that UTOP is for our CAMEL 403 and later. So again, the solver works as it's supposed to. If I go to a, a much older switch that's for CAMEL 402, and ask OPAM to do exactly the same thing. It's OPAM's job to figure out how to make that happen. So it will go through all of the previous versions, figure out which packages are required, and eventually the solver takes a little bit of time to come up with this with the older packages because there are too many things to consider. Um, it comes up with a solution and it's actually given us UTOP 2.2 in this instance. I'm not going to let that go ahead because that will take a long time. So that's a very brief introduction to OPAM that I hope is not too much of a surprise. Um, OPAM also has the ability to manipulate additional repositories. There are admin commands for updating those repositories. There's a whole subsystem for pinning packages uh, to specific versions or to um, for um, working on actual development versions themselves. And you can have uh, local switches where you put a, a switch inside your repositories and everything else. But that's all in OPAM 2.0 which was released in September 2018. OPAM 2.1 was released last summer. So well, just this the summer just gone. So in that meantime, there's been quite a large passage of time. And let's have a dive into some of the things that we've actually worked on in OPAM 2.1 in that intervening nearly three years. So everything that we've added to OPAM 2.1 has been about improving the quality of life for using OPAM, at least trying to. So we have either been trying to make things faster, more reliable, easier to use, or preferably all three of them at the same time. I think one of the biggest places where that's noticeable is in switch creation. Um, so in way back in 2018, when we released OPAM 2.0, the largest change relative to OPAM 1 was that the compiler ceased being a special case. So in OPAM 1, there was a lot of special knowledge baked into OPAM, a special package format that allowed you to specify OCaml itself. That got removed. We added enough features to OPAM 2 to mean that it was just a normal package like anything else. The problem is that the way that was implemented has leaked out to users and is a little bit of a usability issue. You have to pick between, as you may know, OCaml based compiler, OCaml variants, OCaml system. You have to remember what they mean. And um, we've now got it to the stage that most of the time you should just be able to say, I would like OCaml, please. And there's then the work that's been done in order to facilitate that happening then actually means that upgrading our camel in a switch should be considerably less painful than it was before. So going back to an example, if I switch to an our camel 412 switch here, this switch has got our camel 412.0 in it. So maybe it's one I haven't touched for a few months and it's got UTOP 
in it. So again, that, that probably fits with the release earlier this calendar year of, of Camel 412. Um, in OPAM 2.0, the precise runes to move this switch from our Camel 412.0 to our Camel 412.1 are um, rather difficult to remember, and they're extremely unreliable. I'm very pleased to say that in OPAM 2.1, we have dealt with the unreliable. We will aim in future versions to try to deal with the memorability of it. So in OPAM 2.0, the core concept for the switch was that you had a list of packages, and there was a subset of those packages that we regarded as the base of that switch. And those packages, whenever you were installing something, were fixed. So they were not permitted to be changed. So in OPAM 2.0, our Camel-based compiler at version 4.12.0 would be regarded as the base of this switch, and that cannot alter, which is fine. Usually that's what you want, because otherwise, every time you install or upgrade, your switch would attempt to meander towards the latest released version of our Camel. Um, the problem was what happens when you actually wanted that to happen. So we've replaced base packages completely in OPAM 2.1 with a new um, feature called switch invariance. Sorry, wrong command. And the idea behind this is instead of having a list of base packages, we have a package formula that describes exactly what the switch needs to satisfy in its base. So in this case, rather than saying the switch consists of our Camel-based compiler 4.12.0 with all its dependencies, we just say we would like the Camel package to be between versions 4.12.0 and not 4.13. So in other words, it specifies the latest release within the 4.12 series. And having done that, it means we can actually just say OPAM upgrade. At which point we let the solver do its usual work. And we can see here that it's going to upgrade our Camel 4.12.0 just to 4.12.1. So it's not meandering into 4.13. It's certainly not installing trunk and installing a development version of our Camel. And on top of that, it will upgrade the rest of the switch at the same time as part of a normal package. So UTOP will get upgraded. It will all be built into the same soul. So the idea is it's easier, fewer invocations of OPAM, and it actually does what you need. It gets even better when we start looking at using system compilers. So I'm going to switch, hopefully successfully, to another running container and show what I think can best be described as a car crash with OPAM 2.0, which I hope isn't too familiar. So this is a focal container that I have upgraded to here suit. So it is, it's our Camel package installed by apt has changed from our Camel 481 to our Camel 411 OPAM, on the other hand, hasn't yet done anything. So when I run OPAM list, I get this strange message at the top that at least alerts me to the fact something's wrong. Our Camel system has disappeared from the list and it's not quite clear what's happening. If you try to install something, um, OPAM would then complain a bit further. So you think, okay, I'll run OPAM upgrade. Let's see what happens. We get that error again or warning again. The solver's doing a little bit of thinking and then suddenly we get a whole series of strange sounding error messages that do mention a few things called base packages and some other strange things going on. So maybe at that point, I don't know, you go on to discuss, you go on to forum somewhere else, IRC, and somebody says, oh, maybe you need up, uh, unlock base or something. You start to hear about this very strange option that you've never come across before. So you attempt that. And OPAM goes away and thinks about it again. And this time it comes back with an answer. But the only problem is it's not the answer we expected because we know that the system compiler on this computer is, is 4.11.1, but it's going to upgrade us to 4.13.1, and it's going to build it from sources. So that's not what we wanted either. It turned out that the actual room to correctly update the system compiler is to explicitly install that system compiler like that. And finally, on this, up, I would say, really quite unmemorable command for something that maybe needs to happen every six months or so, you actually get the upgrade that you expect from 481 to 4111 and is actually reinstalling the old Camel system package because it's removed it. Um, let's see that in OPAM 2.1. So just to... We are now switched to 2.1 there. Um, so we do OPAM list again. This time, it's not complaining at us. We only asked it to tell us what was in the switch. So OPAM is slightly more polite this time. It doesn't look into the problem with the package. So we can see that OPAM's view of the world is that it's our Camel system 481 that's in that switch. 
And now we simply say, open operate. Now it identifies there's something not right about the OCaml system package. It says, I need to reinstall this, what happens next? And we get exactly the correct answer first time from just a normal open upgrade. That would leave that, that be for the time being. Um, other things that we've been doing have been improvement to the ability to access alternate versions of the compiler, so compiler options. You might have seen this if you've been following the announcements of, of um, alpha and beta releases of the 412 and 413 or Camel compilers. So in the past, if you wanted an F Lambda switch, you had to remember that that meant you needed our camel variants dot version of the compiler plus F Lambda. You had to hope you didn't want any other options to go with it that hadn't been thought of. And you also needed to create probably a fresh switch and do it. So this feature with the switch invariants now means that instead you just say, I would like our camel option F Lambda, please. And you can add it to an existing switch. At which point, again, Solver doing a little bit of work. OPAM will then reply back saying, oh, I've looked at that. And at this point says, I'm just gonna to need to do a rebuild, that's fine. So it switches automatically from the old OCaml based compiler, which means unaltered um, vanilla sources. It switches to an OCaml variant package that you didn't need to specify at all. It installs the option you did and then says, well, the whole switch has got to be rebuilt. And that again would happen automatically. And we'll skip that in the interest of time. And you can do that in switch creation as well. So again, here, I sorry, my terminal is wrapping very oddly, which of remote desktop, Windows terminal and Ubuntu are to blame. But at this point, I'm actually creating, you can just about see it, a package where I've said, give me your camel 4.13.1, this is impossible to specify an OPAM2 thing, and give me F Lambda, and it will then go away. And so immediately infer the switch invariants that, that corresponds to that, which is the package list with the one version constraint. Ooh. Oh, I can't type. Or camel option F lambda. Um, again. Questions? Professor Jay Gabernethy here again on the 12th floor of Coda. We've got Spring Street behind me. I'm going to try something different today. A little surprise for you guys. Doing a lecture with an actual physical whiteboard. What do you think? Nice and clean. Let's do some teaching on it. So today we're going to talk about graphs. In fact, for the next several lectures, we're going to, we're going to discuss graphs. As you already know, a graph G is a set oh, of vertices. There we go. And we can actually see the compiler if I can talk over a um, <laughs> invader. Um, the compiler is now going ahead and actually building a 413 switch. So that, that then works very nicely. You can specify the options you want. You can put them in the invariant. So you could have a switch that must be a, um, a, a, uh, 412, um, 413 switch, and it must have F Lambda. So that's switch creation. Um, another area that we've done an awful lot of work in is DEPEXs. So up to this point, we've been talking about pure or camel, but eventually we get to the stage that we need some C things. We need something that comes from the, um, else that comes from the um, OS package manager. So OPAM1 had a DEPEX plugin, in fact, a plugin architecture, I think was added in OPAM 1.1, and that carried on into OPAM 2. So the idea was to have a command so that you could pass the list of packages you want to install, and the plugin would ensure that your OS package manager was up to date. So for example, we could then say, another quick switch, in OPAM 209 on this Debian container, I could then say, OPAM install MySQL, Little bit of thought, gives us a solution, but very quickly that goes wrong because the system package is missing. So the idea behind that is that we then say open depex to MySQL in 2.0 world. It says, oh, there's a plugin I need to download, which was done largely for maintenance because it meant the plugin could move more quickly than, than OPAM1 necessarily did. It then goes on to look at what's on the package manager and says, ah, there is a system package missing. May I call apt, at which point give OPAM permission to do so. And that's it, it now downloads and installs that. Then we can go back to what we were doing in the first place. And finally, we can install MySQL. So there's a few problems with that. We'll get there, but we had to issue a lot of commands. It is possible with flags 
to turn it into one command, you can tell the depx command to go on and run the OPAM install. But even when you did that in OPAM 2.0, the solver is still called twice. So if you had a particularly complex um, package set to install, then you're, you're fundamentally wasting a lot of time. And even worse, on top of that, the solver could return different answers between these two solutions. So you, it, it is entirely possible, depending on how the package repository is set up, to be that you, the packages you install the DEPEX for, it then selects different ones for which you haven't installed the DEPEX. So your CI system then fails. And when I say your CI system fails, I mean OPAM repositories. CI was quite capable of picking that, that up, as was um, GitHub Actions and OCaml CI and various other systems. So it was a serious issue that had to be worked around. Um, on top of that, it meant you couldn't depend on system packages and what was already there. So for example, if we look at the actual definition of the MySQL bindings in OPAM, it actually doesn't need MySQL, it's capable of, of using either. So we can have MariaDB or MySQL. So if we just quickly restart that container, and this time install by hand, the MariaDB library. The bit that's annoying at this stage is that when I install MySQL, it will still ask me to install conf MySQL, even though MariaDB is there. So the only way in OPAM 2.0 that I could, could get around that is actually to explicitly say, give me conf MariaDB. Give me a word, you know, I, I will tell you what it is I want you to install at that point, at which point it says, oh, okay, I can do that. And that will then work straight through. So similarly, in OPAM 2.1, we've got rid of that plugin completely. The whole thing has been integrated into, into OPAM itself. So now you issue the same rune to start with. The solver comes back with an answer, eventually. Still with conf MySQL, but that's just fine. This time it immediately says, no additional solving. It already knew this, there's a depex missing. Would you like me to install it? Say yes, let's go ahead with that. And then in it goes, downloading, and that's going to carry on as normal. Now, similarly, if I restart this container, when OPAM catches up with me, let's quickly restart on that one. This time, I'm going to do just as I did in the 2.0 version. the headers in manually. So we now have a system that is capable of linking um, against MariaDB. This time when I say OPAM install MySQL, not only do you have the nice integration of the DEPEX, but OPAM will automatically say, oh, this DEPEX is there. That means that this is a better package to choose than the MySQL one. And it's actually offered me conf MariaDB straight away. So I can go ahead and do that and it will much more quickly get you the package you requested based on its constraints. Um, having done that, there's then nothing that stops you. And just wait while it catches up with me. Um, there's nothing that then stops you saying, oh, actually, I did want MySQL bindings as well. And I can do that afterwards. And as um, OPAM normally would, it will then say, okay, that's fine. I need a DEPEX for that, and I'll need to recompile that package, but then everything will be satisfied. And just as before, it's still asking for the same, same part there. So I say switch creation, DEPEX, I would say are probably the two, they're certainly the two features I wanted, wanted to demonstrate today. I'm gonna to talk about some of the other ones instead. So I just stop the screen share for now. So what else did we do in OPAM 2.1? There was, um, in just the same way as we integrated the DEPEX plugin, there is also a plugin for creating lock files. So that's where you take the current state of your switch, your project and say, I want the exact versions of these packages specified, write it to an OPAM file, so that I can commit that to my repo and then share that with other developers or just say this is a known blessed configuration. So that's actually been in existence since OPAM 2.0. Um, the facility to create switches based on it was always there. The plugin to create the lock files, well, sorry, the, the facility to create the lock files was itself a plugin and we've simply moved that in and blessed that as being a supported OPAM feature in 2.1. Um, 
one of the things that delayed the release by uh, longer than would have been nice was that we discovered after the fact that OPAM 1 to OPAM 2, although it took three years, was actually easier than going from 2.0 to 2.1, because the main thing that we were able to do with the 2.0 rewrite was to throw away OPAM 1. So the package repository was, was automatically rewriting, pull requests against one were mirrored to another. We didn't have to worry about backwards compatibility of the formats. We just had to make sure that the packages could be mechanically upgraded. And don't get me wrong, it was a ton of work, but we didn't then have to support OPAM 1.2 afterwards. So we were just redirecting to an old repository and it was sunsetted a couple of years ago. With OPAM 2.1, they're kind of both out there. Both binaries are there. They have different command lines. So there were there are two or three features that we then added. Um, the it, initial name for it was CLI versioning, so command line interfacing. It, it's a feature that I have no problem saying we mercilessly cribbed from Dune. So uh, it's inspired by Dune's Lang Dune stanza in your Dune project files. And it just says, if we could have a way that the OPAM command line knows which version of OPAM you expected that command line to work for, then we can make your scripts rather less painful in the future. So to give an example, again, I'll turn them back up, come back to this one. Um, if I issue that rune going back to OPAM upgrade minus unlock base, OPAM now helpfully says to you straight away, that's not correct, it's not called unlock base anymore, it gives you a clue about what the new version of the, um, of the command line is, and it tells you what you need to do in order to run that way. So what we now have, if you want to have commands that are compatible with OPAM 2.0, is you just set an environment variable before doing it. So at which point it now says, oh, I'm in 2.0 mode. I know what that means. It still means translate it to update invariant, but OPAM can do it automatically for you. And it then offers to upgrade the switch, which we'll skip for now. Um, similarly, it also provides a way of you guarding yourself against using new features you didn't mean to. So if you have OPAM upgrade there and you try to use the OPAM 2.1 command for it, it will then say, no, that doesn't work because that's available in a newer version. And so it gets rejected. Um, so that, that went all the way through. Um, and so the whole of OPAM, we have it for enumerations. It's for environment variables. There are warnings if you attempt to use new environment variables that have no meaning. And so forth. OPAM 2.1 would say, if you cheated and said OPAM update invariant equals yes in the environment, it would still say, I've ignored that because you requested OPAM CLI equals 2.0. Um, and so it, it's had no effect. Um, similarly, we'd actually had a various um, plugins and other utilities were appearing that were using OPAM's libraries to manipulate the state. Um, and again, this had been fine while we were in OPAM 2.0 and everything was compatible, but the changes, especially for switch invariants, meant that the OPAM routes have been upgraded, at which point nothing works if it uses the 2.0 libraries, which seemed okay to start with, except that it was far too easy to end up in a situation that software that your commands that you had installed to switch just stopped working. So we actually have applied the versioning even back into the root. Uh, OPAM, it's a config we just cheekily look, as, as one should never look in the um, internal files of an OPAM switch. So in fact, where in the past, all of these files just would have said, oh, my OPAM version is 2.0, it still says that but it's added an extra field below to say, but I've been written by OPAM 2.1. And the OPAM library, uh, version 209 of the OPAM libraries that we released understand that. And what they will do at that point is say, I can read the switch and I can't write it. And so we've introduced a mechanism from 209 onwards as a compatibility step that actually allows you to write plugins that read OPAM state directly, that will carry on working all the way through whichever versions of OPAM we come up in the 2.0 series. Um, and then similarly, uh, other under the hood changes, um, all on the interest of making things faster. I'd already mentioned the interleaved um, download and build, which I think is possibly one of the, maybe one of the least noticed, but most appreciated features of OPAM 2.1, because it does simply mean that OPAM install is actually considerably faster, even without parallelism. Um, there's also a trick that uh, Louis Gesper implemented a year or so ago, that OPAM update has, be, has tried to become a little bit faster by instead of storing a flat um, checkout of all of the OPAM repositories you've added, it keeps them tarred and tries to use Tumpfs to make it faster. And on most systems, that's had the effect of making OPAM update a much faster operation as well. Um, so yeah, 
things to come. We are not wanting to spend three years working on OPAM 2.2. The plan is to release OPAM 2.2 early next year. Um, some of the features that are slated for it at the moment, there's a feature called subpath pinning that was um, in fact implemented for 2.1, but it didn't quite make the cut. So the code is in OPAM, but it's completely disabled. That's the ability to pin a package, but using where the package resides in subdirectory of the repository. That's being polished off and turned into a full feature for OPAM 2.2. In just the same way as we've got a CLI versioning technique and um, our OPAM root versioning, the next stage that we want to go to is to be able to do that with OPAM files themselves, because the features that we need for OPAM 2.2 actually involve changing the format of repository package files. Um, now, that was another issue that we escaped in OPAM 1, because we just skated over it. We just said, well, that's fine, we're going to do an upgrade. So the, the aim here is that we will introduce a plugin that the old versions of OPAM will be able to use. It will say, I've been given a file that's for OPAM 2.3, would you please give me something that's for OPAM 2.0? And the plugin can then make the choice, either if there is a mechanical way of rewriting the file, which for some of the features that we're adding, there really are, there could just be more commands that you can pattern match and interpret, then it will rewrite it in a way that OPAM 2.0 can accept. And if not, it will just get rid of the fields that aren't going to be recognized and put available false at the bottom so that you have a package repository that may be for OPAM 2.2 or for OPAM 2.3, but that can still be synchronized with by OPAM 2.0. And the decision then is as a package author that you've decided, I don't want OPAM 2.1 users to be able to use this feature anymore. Um, we're also adding finally a SEMBA operator. So that will deal with the last part of switch creation where I said that the, the runes for upgrading have become more reliable and the SEMBA operator should also make them actually easier to remember because you will just be able finally to say, I would like a camel five in my switch, please. I'll just write that. Um, the elephant in the room is Windows support, um, which I have tried to hint that I do something about that by using Windows Terminal to show the previous examples. Um, it is finally landing in OPAM 2.2. Um, Andreas Hauptmann's Herculean effort keeping OPAM repository MinGW going has been fantastic for the last five years. He has indicated that he wants to um, sunset that repository. It's finally given us the proverbial kick to get the OCaml based compiler packages in upstream OPAM repository into gear and working correctly so that you can use Windows OPAM and use upstream OPAM repository. Um, and on that, as a final piece of a demonstration, we're also looking at integrating fast OPAM switches into OPAM 2.2. Um, so this is some work that I've been doing with my uh, OCaml core developer hat on, um, where we're trying to allow switches to be cloned more quickly so that OPAM switch creates, so that I could do a demo like this hopefully in six months time and actually show the switches being created as opposed to saying, we'll skip that now because that will take too long. So here, as you can see, this is Windows Docker running and it's running a slightly custom build of OPAM 2.1 that includes shell integration. Um, I've created a found project. It's just there. But as you can see, it's using a part a function from OCaml 4.13. So I think, ah, oh, okay. In this OPAM route, I've got these two switches that are special versions of OCaml at the moment. The test back ports of a series of patches that are called relocatable. So at the moment, it's on OCaml 4.12. I can say, right, give me a switch, please. Give me 4.13.0. OPAM is going away, thinking about it just as it did before, quite quickly on this particular one. So at this point, OPAM is detecting the installation of Visual Studio in this Docker container. It's latching down where the Microsoft C compiler is. Their scripts on this particular one are slow, not mine. Once that's latched, it's then looking for another OCaml 413 compiler with exactly the same configuration in the OPAM switch. And at this stage, it now copies it, which means that you have nine seconds for OPAM switch creation with an entirely fresh OPAM switch with a, with a compiler inside it. So within an OCaml 4.13.0. So the hope is that that might land 
it's not clear if it'll make it for 414. It may be that it's at some point around the 500 series. We'll see how the backports are doing. But the hope is that fast OPAM switches will also be coming to, uh, somewhere soon to an OPAM route near you. And I think that's possibly a good point for me to stop talking. Okay, thank you so much. This was great. Um, learned a ton. This is this was wonderful. So I want to um, open up the discussion. Um, first questions about OPAM for David. Just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, great presentation. I have three. Um, maybe I'll just start with the easy one. Um, mm -hmm. I really like how in the OCaml open source world, you can you depend on a package and you run into a problem and then you can just kind of say, okay, OPAM source package, save it here, add debug statements, rebuild against it pretty easily, and then see what's going on and then you know further get sucked into upstreaming the fix. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty great. Um, I feel like I might be doing pinning wrong because that workflow is like a little bit difficult. Like let's say I have a package, um, I OPAM source download package name and save it somewhere. And then I say OPAM pin add package directory where I saved it. Um, that process where then I like go to that directory and add a debug statement and want to rebuild my whole project against it, I feel like I have to do then OPAM pin remove foo, and then it says, OK, removing, then I'm rebuilding with the, with the standard one. And then I have to do OPAM pin add foo directory and do that over and over again. My, is there a faster way to do this? There, there, there is. I would say that the answer comes in two parts. OPAM upgrade foo. When, it, when foo is a pin, this is a, the strange um, remembering the precise rune. OPAM upgrade foo when foo is a pin will refresh the cached copy of it and then recompile the switch. So that's, that's a, however, I have to say that we're, we're, um, we're moving in a direction that tries to avoid using pins for development in as much as Dune's vendoring is better. Um, right. It, for, for the, 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 the pin, in, in essentially, well, I, it's, it's sort of a hybrid of the two. So that you'd start off when you're working on a fix, because chances are you end up then needing to look at something else that needs fixing as well. I, I, think I did a blog post a few years ago where the fixes were across three Mirage libraries, at which point OPAM pinning is, is, her, is well, frankly, horrific, because you're just having to remember to keep all of these pins up to date. And the reason it's horrific in OPAM is because really it's the job of a build system to do that um, when things have changed, not, not a package manager. And so I think the, the, the nicer way moving forward is that we use Dune to develop the patch. But then once you've got the branch and you want to test it against other things, of course, you can push that um, new branch of yours somewhere or you could just pin to a Git branch that you're not expecting to do development work and that you just now want to see our other packages working. So we can end up with a hybrid approach between the two. Uh, but yes, OPAM upgrade food is the main answer to a question. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Save me so much time. Thank you. Mm. Oh, there's some more questions. Everybody nervous, <laughs> or nervous as to who's going to speak next. David, it might be worth showing um, Michael the uh, the way that we did the uh, submodules in Ocurrent as an alternative pinning, because that, that's yes. a really nice illustration of the uh, you know of the Git workflow. So this uh, example, hang on, let me fire up a browser. Now we <laughs> can I, of course now zoom on my desktop is being strange. Oh, there we go, share screen, got it back. Um, I can now share. So one of the projects that we maintain or, or have written at, um, at Ocaml Labs is, uh, a builder for Docker base images. So I just share this part through. Um, so this is, hmm, can I make that a little larger? Oh, oh that's too large. Um, th th this is a, a system that once a week or whenever we want to kick it off, we can say clone OPAM repository and it goes away and then builds a huge number of Docker images containing OCaml. 
uh, images.ci.camel.org. And these images then are built. So you've got, for example, um, you've got Debian 11, and then you expand into it, and it's got uh, various permutations of our camel. And all of them then get put into multi arch images and uploaded to the hub to our camel slash OPAM. And the primary purpose of these is that, is that they sit as the base for um, the CI systems for OPAM, rep, for OPAM repository and for other OCaml projects. Um, the maintenance trick that we use for those, rather than having to do OPAM pinning, as you can see, is each one of these has got uh, different components held at different submodule versions. And the nice thing that Git adds with that for the workflow is that when I make, we, we have to change the base image builder once per month, uh, either with new distros or could Microsoft give a new cumulative update each month and that information comes in. That involves a change in certainly our camel Docker file. So the sub module is here, as well as in the base image builder itself, it is possible to develop all of that in the same work tree. You actually start the PR from within the sub module and having pushed the PR up to the to the OCaml Docker file repo, you can also commit the submodule change in a PR on Docker base images, and GitHub allows that to work. So you end up without um, dangling branches that you that, or, or dangling uh, sorry um, orphan commits that you can end up with uh, in, in normal workflow. So in fact, yes, uh, we occasionally have trouble remembering to ensure that the PRs have actually been merged. But um, but yeah, the the um, submodule way is another nice um, trick for that. Other questions? Talk a little bit about um, governance and uh, security uh, on the package repository itself. I know uh, NPM had a problem where someone removed something and uh, then, you know, the Maven repository had a problem where someone added a uh, malicious or, or faux malicious uh, thing. Um, I'd just love to hear a little bit about how that's managed. Okay, th there's a, there's a um, few, there's a, there's a few parts to this. So, um, We've never removed a package. In fact, there's general policy in open repository if you don't remove them. Unfortunately, that's making the solver slower and slower. So it, it creates the need for more innovation to deal with that. Um, what we do do if there's a package that's actively broken is that the package remains, but it gets changed to available false, because at least that is a, is a better error to give to a user. Um, for actually protecting users, um, OPAM by default is sandboxed. So all of the builds run within bubble wrap. Um, that, I have to say, is done from the view of protection from accidental error. Uh, that spawned from an error in a make file uh, a few years ago for anybody who was using MacOS, and I apologize if you were stung by it, that um, OPAM issued accident, well, a package's build instructions caused OPAM to issue rm minus rf slash. And it turns out that on MacOS, that is not guarded. So, um, and so as a result of that, um, sandboxing was very quickly added into OPAM 2 at about one, one of the uh, mid beta stages, um, which is, is why it's there. So that protects it. But I have to say that doesn't protect against malicious um, operation because at that point it's got read only access to your entire system. Although in the build network access is, is um, denied, I, I wouldn't rely on that to stop exfiltration of information. So it's still very much trusted. Um, what we're doing beyond that or what, is, what we're doing, what um, Hannes Maynard has been doing for the last few years, is that there is work in progress to have um, trusted updates to OPAM repository where right from the package tarball all the way through to the metadata in OPAM is signed uh, in, a, in a mildly complicated system, but th that allows it to be that it's signed without a single source of trust is the, the reason for the complexity. So it allows OPAM repository maintainers to be able to edits important metadata such as the constraints or descriptions without requiring new signatures and it works with a quorum of signatures. So we're, we're heading in a direction where the code that you actually install has been signed from developer right the way through repository and onto the computer. Um, that's, Thanks. But I'm a, not totally certain on. when that's going to land, is the uh, only uh, caveat. <laughs> of course. Just to follow on to that, um, you know, if there's a package that's been uh, abandoned, um, you know, okay, it was last updated in 2015, and now you know someone wants to do a new version that uses standard live instead of pervasive or whatever it is, um, is there a, a mechanism where it's, that can get taken over, or is it just you know create a new name and, and try and convince everyone to switch? At, at the moment, at, at, at present day, that, that just ha happens. You just decide to do it, so that there's there's no thing at all for um the for the update framework work that's being done for it. Yes, there is a mechanism of, of achieving a quorum to hand over a new key. And it just requires a number of repository maintainers to commit to agree to that that change and then new keys are issued. So so yes, is 
sorry, there, there's Different. nothing at all now. So in other words, I could upload a new version of something, uh, even if I am not the original uploader. Yes, that's correct. So I say in upload, you, you would open a pull request to a camel slash opam repository and uh, it would be rejected. But, um, but it would be a human that would be verifying that, not. And uh, I have to say, it would be rejected and very occasionally. Errors do slip through where it's like, ah, but again, it's, it's not happened maliciously at the moment. It's happened by accident where somebody's used a name and discovered that it happens. Normally, what would be caught on opam repository is that the CI testing would spot it because, of course, you, you would effectively be uploading a, a new version of something and it would then attempt to build all of the reverse dependencies of that, at which point I, the world is likely to end for that CI run. And it would have said, what's going on here? And say, oh, this isn't a new version of the same package. So it, it's not a problem that we've hit very often so far. I, I can think there was one case in the last year, I think of the name, where somebody did have to go away and venture said, ah, new package. <laughs> um, so. Thank you. I think I'm going to um, stop the recording now, and then we can continue talking, um, but I'll stop that now. <laughs>